perhaps time to get started. I know a few other people are gathering, but we can get started. And as we begin introductions, people will be still joining and taking our seats. Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Sieve, and I'm Director of Economic Development and Placemaking for Destination Medical Center, the Economic Development Agency in Rochester, Minnesota. And we are so pleased to have you join us for this week-long series called Road to Recovery. This is day three. I sometimes say this is actually day four as we kick this off with a conversation with the construction industry about 10 days ago. But we're on Wednesday, day three of this week-long series focused on navigating the path towards reopening or opening key sectors of the economy during this COVID-19 environment. And today's topic is travel, lodging, and conventions. Our digital dialogue is about what the hospitality industry can do to successfully reopen and grow their operations as shelter-in-place orders are relaxed. I'm joined by a wonderful uh, professional panel for a lively conversation that I expect will be both inspiring and practical as we all work together to figure out how to create self safe, healthy, and compelling customer experiences that will spur our travel and encourage meeting planners to return to hotels and convention centers. I will introduce our panel and then we'll ask a couple of questions of the audience before we invite our panelists to begin speaking. But today we are joined by John Edman, who is Director of Explore Minnesota Tourism and Chair of the Board for Brand USA, which is dedicated to marketing the United States as a premier travel destination. Joe Ward, President of Experience Rochester Destination Marketing, Marketing Organization and oversees the operations of the Mayo Civic Center here in Rochester. Angie Richards, Area Director of Sales at Avra Hospitality, representing several downtown Rochester hotels. And Debbie Van Ravenhorst, Regional Vice President of Helms Frisco, a global leader in meetings procurement and site selection. So as you can see, we are blessed with a great group of people to help shape this conversation and to explore new approaches as we enter this post-COVID environment. And maybe I shouldn't call it post-COVID. Uh, we probably are going to be living in a COVID environment, but certainly um, post-crisis. Before we begin our discussion, we wanted to ask you, the audience, uh, a couple of questions to help better inform, inform us, inform the panel as they go about their discussions. Our first question is just to better understand where you're from. So this is a survey. We just want to know where you are, at, where you're at right now. Are you in Rochester? Are you somewhere else in Minnesota? Are you from a nearby state? Or have you joined us um, from a more distant location? So why don't you, we'll take a moment um, to complete that survey. It gives us a better sense of how this conversation and you, as you can see, we have state experts as a part of our panel, as well as local experts. So why don't we take a look to see where um, our, our group is from. Hmm. Nice. So panelists, you can see we're joined by people from around the state of Minnesota, as well as um, people from here locally, but more than 70% of the attendees are from um, other parts of the state. And certainly this is uh, a statewide um, issue and statewide concern. I looked at the registration list and I saw many people from, um, from uh, nearby towns and, and communities that really focus on tourism. So why don't we ask another question? So, so we'll, we'll, we know that we have uh, a lot of people from around the state. Let's ask another question. Again, this will help the panelists as they think about um, how to shape their comments. So if, if I could ask, members of the audience, and there's nearly 200 of you, just for a point of reference, about 200 people have joined this webinar. Uh, and you can check more than one box, but let us know what you came to learn about. Immediate changes, long-term issues, better understanding the governor's platform for COVID-19 preparedness, or perhaps lessons from other businesses that have stayed open or countries that have reopened their economies. 
We'll take um, just another moment or two to give you a chance to respond to this. Why don't we take a look to see what people came to hear about? Well, it looks like people want to know what can we do tomorrow? What can we do immediately um, to help make our customers feel safe? And I think we've got uh, some great ideas about that. Lo what long-term issues and what do we learn from other businesses and for, or perhaps other countries? So with that, uh, sort of learning from other countries and learning from other businesses, maybe I'll use that as a segue to ask uh, John Edmond, um, Director of Explore Minnesota Tourism. John, I've known you for a long time. You've been uh, a, a very, uh, had a very successful career in tourism and guiding tourism organizations. You've led um, this kind of effort through many disruptions, 9-11, the economy, uh, recessions, uh, bad weather incidents, I mean, a whole range of things over the course of your career. What have you learned from some of those experiences that could help apply to what we're going through right now? Well, first of all, thank you, Patrick, for having me, and thanks for everybody uh, tuning in from Rochester and through, throughout the state. Um, I, I guess in the time that I've been the director of Explore Minnesota, and I've worked for DMOs and throughout the country, uh, throughout the globe, actually. Uh, throughout my, my, my career, I've never seen anything quite like this. Yes, we've experienced situations like 9-11, we've experienced natural disasters, we've experienced gas shortages, et cetera. But this is very unprecedented in terms of its impact. It's not just affecting a community. It's not just affecting a state or a country. It's the entire globe. And it's something that we feel that's going to have implications for travel and tourism, not just in the short term, but in the long term uh, as well. This, this, could, this could have impacts in how we travel, how our industry is, uh, is responding to it for months, if not years to come. Well, I think, I think that's um, part of what is so um, compelling about this situation is that really drawing on the expertise of, uh, of many people from across disciplines and across sectors, because this impact is not impacting just one industry. And that's why, as we talk about the series we have going on throughout the week, we're already learning every day from the first day when we had uh, people talking about the office environment and Yesterday, people talking about transportation and today hotels and tomorrow uh, restaurants and retail and later this week, public spaces. It's really all of this. This is affecting so many industries and, and so many and so many sectors. Um, Joe, I, I think about the, the work you do in hosting people that that your business is about creating a space for people to gather. And, and, and what does that look like? And, and I know that Right now, you are reinventing what your space is being used for to be quite responsive. But talk to us about what, what you're learning from others as, as we imagine people gathering again. Well, thank, thank you, Patrick. I appreciate being here as well, and also to the, to the guests that are with me. Uh, it's really important, I think, for all of us to get together. And I did notice in the questions there, you know what, people wanna know exactly what to do. And I think we all do as well. I mean, there's definitely some things that we're learning and hopefully we can share some of those, but those, those are things that we don't exactly know what the, um, maybe it's an overused phrase, but what the new normal looks like. And so for, for us, you know, we do have the opportunity right now where we're, the facility is being utilized um, as a day shelter and an overnight shelter for some of the less fortunate in our community. So that's great that we can help in that way, but it's also given us the ability to sort of try some things out with cleaning, with social distancing, and whatnot that uh, it really is gonna take us forward into the future. So I think for us, I mean, really we're in the hospitality industry, you know, as a, as a representative of a destination marketing organization, as well as of a, an actual, you know, venue for venue management side of things. Um, you know, we wanna make sure that we're looking out for our guests as well, that we, you know, that we're kind of eyeing their issues when we can have them. And we all miss having those guests because we all thrive off the engagement with, with guests. And I think, um, you know, so going in the future, it's really going to be important to, um, you know, to really focus on safety and some of the cleaning and things that we need to do. And so, for instance, right there, you're seeing 
um, you know, a document that we put together. It's really an outline that probably any business is going to need to address, but we've worked with uh, our partners at JLL as well as they, they got that information and worked with, uh, you know, they're working with who, you know, the World Health Organization to, um, you know, to, to follow specific guidelines. But within each of, I think in this total list, there's 15 on two different pages there, but really it's, um, there's so much detail within those that have to work for our businesses. And some of that is gonna take some time to figure out, some of that takes some time to work through. But we really have to be sensitive that uh, cleanliness and safety are more important than, than ever before. And I think in particular, probably from a technology side, um, as well as having a presence that we're doing this kind of cleaning. There is an emotional element to this, you know, as well, that when we get open, when we have guests in here, they need to see that we're doing our job. They need to see that we're on top of that so they can feel comfortable. And, um, you know, and so I'm glad to talk about any of these on the list or certainly any input from any of the other guests. Well, I think, you know, what's so compelling about what you're describing, Joe and Angie, when we talked about this uh, earlier in preparation, that so much of what you all do in the hospitality industry is invisible. Like you do it and you do it by nature. You do it. It's, it's ubiquitous. It's part of what you've always done and you make it invisible. But it sounds to me, Joe, like maybe one of the strategies is in fact wanting it to be more visible because people need to know that they're going to be safe and, and protected. And, and, yeah. uh, yes, I think that that's going to be, yeah, that's going to be critical. I mean, I think everything from signage to, you know, just having a presence, like I said, seeing people repeat it when you're repeatedly cleaning those surfaces. I mean, I, myself, I know that just going out in the community when I'm out, I'm kind of watching if I go to a pick up some takeout from one of our favorite restaurants. Uh, the reality is I'm watching, are they wearing their masks? Are they wearing, are they wearing plastic gloves? That that's going to be the expectation. It should always be the expectation, but it's never more important than now. And I, and you know, earlier Debbie and I, you know, we were talking pre pre call here and, uh, you know, one of the things she talked about as a meeting planner was, you know, having more questions in some time, at some point than answers. And I think there's always been from a, our side of the business sort of a we're pitching to meeting planners, right? There's like, they're, they're the ones we're trying to convince to come to our buildings. And I do think together with our guests, as well as to our planners, there's really going to need to be a spirit of working together to find these answers, right? What is um, your... So so you said two things. You, no, you said two things that are really building on some of the themes that we've been hearing throughout the week. So one, one theme, one thing you just said is working together. The sense of, uh, in the, the, it was Mike Benneke from the construction group who said, "Here I'm sitting with uh, what are sometimes competitors, my competitors, uh, but today we're collaborators." And maybe, it, maybe Angie, uh, think you know, thinking about some of the work that that you and your the hotels that you're part of have been doing in terms of really some technologies that have been in play that you've been engaging with over time that become even more valuable now. And I know we have some slides and some images that, that you might want to refer to. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Patrick. And I echoing what uh, Joe and John have stated too, um, this is certainly a time for collaboration um, more than anything. And uh, as Joe mentioned too, uh, cleanliness happened behind the scenes and maybe all of our organizations and businesses before, but visibility is going to be much more of that expectation moving forward. Uh, as far as uh, being more specific to the attendees looking for very kind of tangible things um, that they can maybe implement within their own businesses, we have a new program um, that Hilton is launching um, called the Clean Stay Program. It focuses on 10 high touch, deep clean areas in our guest rooms. Those are the things that you would normally think of, your light switches, your door handles, thermostats, television remotes. Um, but it also comes with some next step innovation when rooms have been thoroughly deep cleaned. And that's when staff will go ahead and actually place a, a seal on the doors. So it'll have a Hilton clean uh, stay seal so that guests are going to know that there's been extra measures of assurance on their room that they've been deep cleaned and that no one has accessed it since it's been thoroughly deep cleaned. Again, some of those visibility pieces that are going to be those high touches. And certainly throughout our buildings, um, whether it's a convention center or a hotel, there's going to be more focus on those public spaces. In our hotels, that's going to mean fitness centers. It's going to be reimagining what food and beverage service looks yep. like, perhaps. It's going yep. to be contactless check-in at hotels and some of those um, images. So you're seeing an image of both that, that um, clean stay seal 
as well as uh, technology um, that we employ in our hotels called Digital Key, which really allows our guests to, they can check in, they can choose their room, they can access the room um, by opening it from their smartphone, and they can check out all through an application on their phone. So again, those contactless um, touch points that maybe where they would have had interaction with um, hotel employees before um, becomes more of an acceptable norm with social distancing as that perhaps stays for a longer period of time or perhaps wanes in the future. We, we oh, will Debbie, certainly see. Yeah, I'm, I wanna come back to what you were just saying. And Debbie, um, you had said as, as we were preparing for this that in many ways you have more questions than answers. And I wanna use that as a prompt one. I'm gonna ask you, is there a question you wanna ask of, uh, of either Joe or, or Angie or, or John for that matter. But I also wanna remind the audience that there is a Q and A function uh, as a part of this platform. And we would encourage you to use that to ask any question that you might have or better yet, if you have solutions or ideas that you've been thinking about or testing in your own environment, please share those as well. And we will, we will, um, we'll talk about those and, and, and uh, uh, give some visibility to that. So take a look at the Q&A function and take advantage of that. Debbie, you represent uh, people who want to plan meetings and want to start gathering. And, uh, and as you're representing them, what questions do they have? And therefore, what questions do you have that, that you could ask fellow panelists to help you um, respond to? Well, and, and thank you. And, and uh, my colleagues, it's like they all hit really good points that we're hearing every day and it's changing all the time. And um, we realize the meeting planner or the coordinator of a meeting, their role is gonna change completely. And how meetings are gonna look in the future is gonna change. So they're gonna start instead of just, I need a ballroom and uh, two breakouts, they're gonna have to think about all these safety issues that we talked about, all the touchless things. And if your ballroom used to hold 500 people, now does it go down to 300 because of social distancing? They have to think about insurance. If people get sick while on, on um, site, who's responsible? How do they cover it? What does the, the location have for backup for uh, taking care of people? How do they isolate someone that gets sick? Um, mm -hmm. These are things that a meeting planner never, never had to think about before. You're concerned, of course, but you, it was not a detail you thought about. So what we're seeing now is how do you be proactive in your RFPs? Um, you know, Forget about even thinking about when we can start to do this, but what questions do you ask for? What do you need to look for to assure your attendees that where you're going is going to be safe? And that is a whole different role than what they've had in the past. So what if, uh, for example, and Joe, I'm going to put you on the spot here, and but this question for Debbie, what if uh, Joe is a, uh, in, in uh, anticipating hosting conventions or conferences said that as a part of the standard, um, all attendees need to have their temperature taken before they enter. They need to respond to a questionnaire that asks about in their health status or a cough or any symptoms. Would that be a value add? Would your customers, Debbie, would they say that's a good thing and that's a, that's a, a venue we want to use? And, and Joe, is that something you've thought about and, and, and how would that feel to you as a, as a venue operating operator? Debbie, you first. Uh, well, sure. And that's one of those things that the question is, they would probably uh, love it. Then the question is, who pays for it? Mm -hmm. it? I mean, that kind of equipment and being able to set up for that is going to be, there's going to be a cost tied to it. So these are different cost items, but budget items that people have to think about. So if you have to have the, the right thermometers to do that, who, who has that? Who provides it? Do you hand mm -hmm. out masks and gloves at check-in? Uh, those mm -hmm. are all the things that they didn't have to ever supply at a meeting. Mm -hmm. And I, I think for us, you know, we're still very much in the exploratory stage on some of these things, you know, um, you know, we probably do have to have some sort of, you know, we've been exploring and researching temperature, you know, readings and how do we do that? I think the questions we now have, or we've looked in, we see some equipment that's out there, we're getting pricing, we have capital planning, you know, underway, but how do we do that in coordination with public health, you know, to make sure that we're doing it the right way or to make sure that we're not violating any HIPAA, you know, HIPAA rules. And I think those are questions that every, it seems like right now, every rock we lift up, there's some more, more things underneath to answer, but every step of the way we're, we're getting there and we're going to be able to provide better answers. I think we're, you know, I'm glad and proud that we're probably uniquely positioned because of the Mayo Clinic right down our, you know, right down the road. And so we can certainly lean on them 
uh, for any advice they may be able to give us in our county health department. I know that uh, I was really glad to see Angie talking about the, the clean safe program that they have at Hilton Worldwide. And uh, you know that emanates here from Rochester as well because that was also a partnership with the Mayo Clinic. And so I think um, you know, we can't assume that we know all the answers, but we can, we can dig to find the right questions to continue to ask. And when, uh, you know, we'll be more ready than ever before when we do get the, the chance to open. Patrick, yeah, John, yeah. can I just jump in from uh, this conversation? I just want to take it to a little bit of a different perspective. First of all, the things that the, that the panelists are, are talking about in responding to this um, pandemic, all of the things that are, you know, occurring in hotels with conventions and, and meeting planning. Absolutely, those are the things from a public health perspective that have to occur and that are occurring. I have been so impressed with what I'm seeing all throughout the state and what communities are doing, hotels are doing, resorts are doing, golf courses are doing. Everyone is just taking this so incredibly seriously. But the piece that, that I kind of come back to is the consumer. Uh, consumers have all been staying at home for a long time. There's this, I mean, we've seen some research. Yes, our industry is incredibly hurt, but there's a little bit of a pent up demand that people want to get out. Uh, they want to just get out of their homes. They do want different things, but what can they do? Where can they go? And this is the most important. Will they be safe? Because there's this hesitancy on the part of consumers. Yeah, I really want to get out and travel, but Boy, I don't know. How am I being protected? How, how are these things addressing my concerns? How is it going to affect my family, et cetera? And so we've got to make the connection between the things that are happening with the consumer to reinstill confidence on the part of the, the general public that travel is something that you can do more than just dream about, that you could actually take a trip. And, and that's the piece I think we have to get back to is instilling that confidence in the consumer that that you know, things are going to be different, but travel is okay. Our hotels, our resorts, our convention centers are taking care of the consumer and they will be taken care of moving forward. So again, I think that's, that's kind of an, a very big piece that we need to focus mm -hmm. on. Well, I think, that's, I think that's a really important point that ultimately consumers are gonna to have to feel like this is a good thing, that this is a safe thing. And, and Angie, and so Joe talked about the fact that we're home to Mayo Clinic, and that actually came up in one of our other pre presentations. Uh, Melanie Bjorkman from RSP Architects talked about how, as she's thinking about designing office spaces now, she also designs in the hospital and clinic environment. She said, there are a lot of practices and a lot of things that we can bring from the hospital clinic right into the office environment. And I wonder, you uh, you showed the screen about the um, the... Clean, uh, the, the clean safe. Yeah, clean safe um, that your uh, Hilton is doing with Lysol and with, with Mayo. Uh, talk to us more about how will you make the, the customer, the consumer feel like it's safe, like the hotel is as safe as their home is. Right, that certainly is going to be our um, next challenge moving forward is to have guests feel safe. Um, we certainly, um, are going to talk a lot about collaboration. Um, as we heard, um, this partnership for the clean stay room is developed with RB, which is the maker of Lysol, and Mayo Clinic's infection prevention and control team. Um, they assisted to um, in the development of these enhanced standards, um, even new technologies, um, and training programs for staff. There will certainly be new things that are, are talked about. Um, one of the um, possible changes is um, disinfection technologies. So right now there's there's exploration just, of adding yeah. um, no electrostatic sprayers um, such as ele electrostatically charged disinfecting mist and ultraviolet light san sanitized surface and objects. Um, I think those new types of technologies are going to be things that guests are going to look forward to feel safe. But again, as I mentioned before, it's going to be a lot of the visibility. I think Joe touched on that as well. Um, guests are going to want to see um, employees front of house in personal protective equipment with their masks on, with their gloves, um, constantly disinfecting um, touch points. And as we relook to imagine um, what our hotels are going to look like, you're going to see signage. You're going to see um, limiting the number of guests in elevators due to social distancing. You're going to see where 
maybe restaurants in-house offered buffets for food service or um, executive level or even as a hotel brand, some offer more of a continental style grab and go breakfast. Those types of things are going to be reimagined, which I do believe will all allow guests to feel safer in their travel. And I guess the bottom line is when consumers are ready to travel, we'll be ready, ready to safely host them. So is there a role, um, John and or Joe, to, so Angie mentioned visibility. So she can, so what I, what I take from that is being visible in their environment in terms of visible of, around what they're doing to make people safe. So people walk in and they know that this is a safe place. Is there visibility, Joe or John, that you and your organizations can provide to hotels that are exemplary, exam, you know, that are exemplary of this of this effort and this in this movement, that would in fact help raise the bar for all hotel or lodging environments. Um, go ahead, uh, Joe. No, no, I was actually going to say you want to take the first crack. Well, at it? sure. <laughs> um, you know, I think that it's really uh, it's important for for us to hear. We're trying to actually collect stories uh, about what the industry is doing so we can help amplify that through our channels to get out to Minnesotans and the surrounding states. As I said before, I, I, I'm just amazed at how many things I'm hearing like this that are that are getting that are that are being done, and we just want to make sure that consumers know about it. The other thing I just want to mention is that hopefully sometime in the near future. Uh, we're going to try to get out a message uh, to consumers that essentially says, when you're ready, we're ready. And I, when I'm just listening to the rest of you here, it gives me confidence in that kind of message because you are all trying to be ready for when those consumers say that, yeah, I want to leave. I want to get out of my house. I want to go visit this community. Mm -hmm. And you're telling me, and I've heard this before, all the steps that you're taking to reassure consumers. So it's that matching of what you're doing and what consumers want to do uh, that just, I think, fits so well the kind of recovery messages we need for the short term to get travel and tourism at least on the road to recovery. So I, I, I think that, and Joe, maybe you want to respond to that as well, but I think that, that should be inspiring to everybody who's on this call or on this webinar watching and thinking about what they're doing, that that's our job right now is to be ready when the customer is ready. And I don't know if John, Joe, you wanted to say more about that, but as he's, as he's thinking about that, Debbie, I'm gonna come back to you about a question that has to do with uh, meeting planners, uh, the work meeting planners do. But in particular, I want, I'm gonna ask a question about the kind of uh, social, um, social functions that might happen in the future um, in this environment. Will we lean more towards um, uh, bike rides as a part of a, uh, of a conference or a convention or outings that, that are more, uh, more around the sort of outdoors or silent sports, if you will, rather than gathering uh, around, the, uh, around the, the cocktail table? So I'll come back to you on that, but uh, Joe, uh, any any further reaction to what you can do to help give visibility to the hotels and, and lodging that are really upping the game? Yeah, I think for us, and I, it's very similar to John's organization, this is from our destination marketing side of our business, right, is we, we've always been in the business of telling stories about destinations. And right now, the story needs to be about, obviously, as we've established here, there's no doubt that it's about cleanliness, sanitation, safety, et cetera. Um, so we need to be gathering up ourselves, like what is going out there? And it's great to hear about Angie's initiatives, but you know, what are other hotel chains doing? Um, and I'm sure they all will, will do um, similar programs. And so communication, I mean, we didn't, we've said a lot about outreach, but we didn't actually say the word communication. So it really is about communication between our partners, our, the leisure travelers who come here, the hospital systems, the public health organizations. If there is ever a time to have solid relationships between all of those, our economic development partners like yourself. This is the time. I mean, first of all, I mean, you're, you're showing a great image that uh, is, uh, we actually lit up the Mayo Civic Center all in blue in support of uh, not just our healthcare uh, warriors out there, but really this was also meant um, and, and certainly got a little less press because we really appreciate everything that everyone's doing on the front lines from a healthcare perspective. But this was also meant for our hospitality workers who have been affected. There's been so many people laid off throughout the country um, and we're all facing this crisis in so many different ways. And so 
this was a great way for us to just say, hey, we're making a statement that we're here for the community. Um, and so I would just to kind of close on that other point. Really, it is about communication. I mean, we are, like I said, we've, if there is any job that we're really looking forward to getting out and doing again, and that's telling the stories of what great people like Angie are doing and other people throughout the city from a restaurant, a brewery, special event venue, a wedding venue, um, they're all they're all just dying to have guests in their building again. And I think the more we communicate about what we're doing, I think that's also going to help the guests feel more comfortable to get out there. Um, and also, of course, I think it's critical to follow the lead of, of your respective governors in your state. That's great. Debbie, Debbie, uh, uh, talk to me about the entire guest experience. So people may come, you're, you're as a meeting planner, you're really wanting to create not only safe hotel environment or, you know, ensuring a safe hotel environment, safe convention hotel, but the whole ecosystem, people come for the entire ecosystem of, of, re, of retail, entertainment, dining, uh, activities that they can do. What will people be looking for in the future? when they are ready to travel, as John said? You know, that's probably one of the biggest questions and challenges because typically before, um, you know, you have a cocktail hour, everybody jams into the bar as quick as they can, packed in like sardines so they can get that first drink. Um, to change that up and like you said, do bike rides or some more independent type things, that kind of defeats the purpose of pulling your people together. The whole reason you want to have a meeting is for that connectivity, that networking, the camaraderie, sharing ideas. Those cocktail hours are probably the best ROIs on meetings because that's where the people are really interchanging with each other. So having them do something different it, it's, it, as far as entertainment, I think it's great if we can give some other options for them. And there isn't a lot of um, the big gatherings, but maybe they split them up. Maybe they've got to break them into groups. So it's smaller groups having reception time so they can still interchange and network. But I don't know, that's, that's what people are trying to figure out. What do we do? How do we get people that they want to come that they see it's worth coming for if they're basically going to go sit in a session and then go sit in their room. Right. So, right. So, so it really is all about the experience and Angie, there's a question that is uh, directed at you and, and, and perhaps others as well, but, but in this more contact, contactless, touchless uh, environment that we're, that we're moving towards, how do you, how do you still create that great customer experience that, that your properties are known for? That is, that is one of the tried and true questions, isn't it? So ultimately, um, what we're doing with technology um, and the service from technology standpoint, um, we give guests uh, more control and choice over how they choose to interact with us when they're staying at one of our hotels. Um, the reason that we really can do these type of th things is to allow our frontline employees um, to be able to really delight a guest when they have those interactions. And so while they may be having fewer interactions or the interaction may look different. For example, we have a texting platform that a guest can use pre-arrival to our property, while on property, or even post time to our property. So instead of that guest maybe um, stopping by the front desk saying, you know, could you bring a few extra pillows to my room? They can certainly just text the front desk and they're still having that same interaction. Um, they actually might be having it faster. Um, they might be receiving um, their services sooner, or they might say, I am going to be um, at my convention meeting until noon today. Would you be able to service my room right away in the morning? And so those type of things where we can really delight the guest um, because we've had opportunities to communicate through different platforms is going to be something that will be even further enhanced. We have guests who are using those services now but we do anticipate that the number of guests who use those touch points will increase dramatically in the future. So I, that makes me want to ask um, John. Uh, so this is what, April 29th. Uh, normally you're probably planning the governor's fishing opener. You're uh, probably ramping up for a big gathering uh, up north somewhere or, or a lake in Minnesota. Talk to us about what some of the lessons that, um, that maybe the more urban environments and, and, are, and have uh, perhaps more resources um, developing technologies. How can that apply? Because I know we have a lot of listeners, a lot of participants on this call from, from other parts of Minnesota. 
What do you think that, what's the, some of the takeaways that you're hearing, not just today, but in your conversations that can help the, the smaller enterprises um, throughout the state? Well, I, I think they, the kind of answer to that question, it really doesn't depend whether you're in the metro area, you're in the greater, greater Minnesota. Um, you know, Angie kind of hit on something there where she's talking about interactions uh, with, with consumers. And I was thinking to myself, um, the, the environment that we're moving into is, yes, uh, fewer interactions, but positive interactions equal quality interactions. So in other words, consumers today, whether you're going to a metro area hotel, whether you're going to a resort in Minnesota, I've talked to a lot of resorters in Minnesota, they're changing all of their protocol in terms of how they interact with consumers. Golf courses are doing the same. They're not really seeing um, people directly as much as they have in the past. But if you go to one of those experiences and you feel like you are taken care of, your needs are being addressed, you can call the front desk, as Angie said, to get a pillow. Or you can check in you know, electronically and just, have, just go right to whatever it happens to be. Those interactions aren't like they were in the past. But if, they're, if the consumer feels taken care of, then I think that will help us on the road to recovery. And again, I don't really think it depends. It, de it, it really matters what part of the state that, that you're dealing in. It's a protocol. It's a change of approach of dealing with travel and tourism that's going to apply no matter what size of community, what size of property you have, what attraction you happen to have. That's kind of the, that's kind of the model that we're going to have to deal with going forward. I think that's that's super helpful, and I think it does remind people that this whole notion that we're in this together, that this is something that none of us is going to solve independently. Joe, you had some examples I thought you shared with us around seating layout. And yeah, it was uh, you know Debbie had mentioned this earlier, you know, a little alluded to it earlier as well. Um, we have our team is already planning um, you know for a future that hopefully we can get to to start sooner than later, but we'll also take the governor's lead on that, but. What you're looking at are basically a couple diagrams of, of areas of our building. Uh, one is basically where a 950 seat, uh, essentially dinner venue was brought down to a 210 seat. So there you'll see three people sitting at what were normally tables of 10. Um, as you can also see, they're separated by six feet. The, chair, the chairs actually are. Um, so we're doing this for every room, every configuration in the building. There's another one there that's uh, our main ballroom from a you know, classroom setup which would normally seat 1500, but in this new uh, social distancing world we're, we're heading into, that would seat 320 people. So uh, we don't know to what capacity we'll be allowed to open and when and to what you know, amount of groups can get together. Um, but these are examples of the types of things our team continues to work on to make sure that we have as close to, as close to a blueprint for reopening as possible. Um, and I certainly would encourage any other venues. This is where we, yes, we are competitive, but I would certainly encourage any of our colleagues throughout the industry to do the same for your property right now and take advantage of this time uh, that you have to, to rethink this. Because in the end, this is really gonna be just another way to, um, to secure safety uh, for our guests. Well, uh, this, there is a question in the, mm -hmm. in the question box and, and maybe Joe or Debbie, uh, but I take it more as a suggestion than a question, but the, the question is about, have you considered facilitated themed networking for meetings so it's more efficient and yet less crowded? So some way of being more themed around the networking that, um, that I think more intentional networking that maybe has a few, therefore fewer people, but the people you're with are, are there for the same reason. And I wonder if that's an idea you've considered. And if not, I want to thank Sophia for offering that as a suggestion and, and one that, uh, that you might want to consider. Debbie, any yeah. thoughts about that? You know, I mean, I think that depends on the industry. Who's having the meeting? Who are the uh, attendees? And it, I mean, I think that's a great idea. It's a, uh, especially if it's, is, if it's kind of topic based or um, you know, like a, a interest based. So it makes a lot of sense to do that, but I don't know if it'll work for every you know, program. Sure. And I think we're gonna see this in phases. I think we're gonna start out with smaller programs, you know, less than 10, and pretty soon it's gonna be that 50, you know, up to 50. And then as, as we can prove that 
uh, we're not relapsing and you know um, bringing the virus back into the environment and and things are safe then it'll start to grow and so it's going to be in baby steps and so some of the stuff you know they have to think about as they're planning ahead but right now we don't know even when the doors are going to open and what do we have to provide is it going to be is a meeting going to go from three days down to one day now because they don't have all the extra pieces of it right yeah and I, i'm really i appreciate that question as well because debbie had mentioned earlier about instead of you know the bike riding is nice but in some ways you're pulling people away and the networking is also a real a very critical part of in-person meetings um, and I do think that that sparked interest just as she was talking about it and then hearing the follow-up question uh, I'm gonna admit I hadn't thought about that part yet from the networking and I have now twice um, And we're gonna you know, I think that leads into again when I said communication Maybe there's another C there which is creativity and it's gonna take a lot of creativity on all our part and again Having those relationships so maybe we can take a few chances with some groups and make sure that we set the right tone for the particular groups because you know um, Having a, a group in here for, um, you know, in research and medicine is, is very different than perhaps a, a group getting together for a social, social gathering or an annual fundraiser. I think John, the, can oh, I jump ahead. in there Yeah, as well? please, please. I think, I think the added C that jumps into that is collaboration. So you're really mm -hmm. going to see um, clients, planners, convention centers, hotel, the whole industry collaborating together. Uh, we're really going to see that agility is going to be critically important. We are going to have to pivot a lot of things very quickly if we're going from three-day meetings to one day or from 10 people to 50 people to 300. And so the rate at which we are going to work is going to be intense, um, which I think is going to be welcome for all of us in our industry. But we're really embracing the shift of being able to collaborate um, with our with our counterparts um, and that's really going to be accelerated over the coming months right john you were going to say something I yeah think. i just i just wanted to add uh just something to the conversation which really is just more of an acknowledgement of a challenge i don't really have a solution yet for this but whether you're talking meetings with you know fewer numbers of people whether you're talking about uh, restaurants that have less seating, whether you're calling a golf, call, talking about a golf course that maybe doesn't have all the banquet activity going on. There are ways or solutions around dealing with the situation, the public health concerns that we're dealing with now. But from a business perspective, the margins on a lot of these businesses are so small. If a restaurant is just barely hanging on, uh, when the restaurants are full, when you consider the, you know, the cost of labor and food and rent, and you've got half the customers, it's really hard to make that business model work when you're looking at a, at a convention center, which you're used to so many people coming through the doors um, and interacting. You cut that in half, well, that's going to affect your bottom, bottom line. A uh, golf course that can't do any of the, 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 the group facilities and uh, the group activities, et cetera that revenue is going to be hurt. So it's going to be kind of a new economy. And some, some of these businesses have been telling me that they just are not going to be able to survive in that environment. I hate to be sort of a Debbie Downer on that, but there's a certain reality that we're going to have to kind of work our way around here in this new environment that, that I think we just have to recognize. Well, I think I'm going to use that as a say, we're running, we're running close to our, uh, our time here. And I, I want to, I want to, uh, use the last few minutes to do a bit of a lightning round. And, uh, and so I'm gonna give you a moment to think about the question I'm gonna ask, uh, which is, what is the silver lining that's coming out of this? What is the innovation that's coming out of this? What is the thing that is going to make us better because of this? And we're gonna, we're gonna do a lightning round of, of comments on that. And, and the reason I ask that question, and I think you, 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 you make that point very clearly John, and, and we have been doing, uh, the point being that uh, things have to change. We have been doing a series of interviews with people in our community here in Rochester, referring to it as the business pivot. And this is really giving visibility to businesses who that are um, moving quickly, innovating, and creating perhaps uh, changes that are forced upon them or maybe at a pace they weren't prepared for, but they're moving on it and they're making changes and that these are probably 
probably sustainable interventions, sustainable changes that they're gonna that are gonna work for them long term. And so we saw an uh, interview with Annie Henderson from Forager and Sarah Miller from Whitespace and a number of others, Rochester Farmers Market. And we're hearing more and more of these. And now I'm gonna ask you all in this sort of lightning round, what is the what is the silver lining, the business pivot, the new innovation that's gonna come out of this that is in fact going to be good and healthy and and, and valuable to our future and angie um because i'm looking because you're making eye contact with me you don't know it but you are uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna call on you first sure um i think that's a, a great segue as we kind of wrap up for the day i think ultimately hospitality is a business of people serving other people and so we go back to that warmth and light of hospitality and um the piece that comes out of it is is kind of what you're showing there um, is that people are going to do things that are uniquely um, capable of or that they come together and collaborate around. Um, earlier in March, um, we lit up our Hilton Hotel in downtown Rochester that you see there on the left um, with a heart on it. The amount of uh, feedback um, that we received off that um, was tremendous. And it, and it wasn't in, in that way that we were looking to promote it or communicate. It was really just to show appreciation for the doctors, our nurses, our medical researchers, our technicians, all of those people, hospitality workers, um, the whole industry that's been affected by the pandemic, um, that we're in this together. And so really, um, I think that that piece that we're going to be each day, we're going to look at embracing the change of what our daily life is going to be moving forward that we're going to be more agile, empathetic, and understanding, and that when consumers are ready to travel, that we will be ready to safely host them. More agile, more empathetic, and more collaborative is what I heard, Angie, as the silver lining. Joe? I think for me, I mean, you know, there's honestly, there's some silver lining in the fact that we now see what a world without travel looks like, because I think we've really heightened the reality that this is important to people. This is something that, you know, if you meet anybody in the hospitality industry, we want to serve, we love serving people. So we miss our customers, we miss our guests, you know? And, um, and so people are seeing like, wow, I didn't realize you know, how much maybe I used that movie theater or, or a restaurant. And so I think for us, it, it gives a heightened sense of the importance of our industry. And that's what I mean. And, 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 it, and people will see that. With that though comes a responsibility that there's the heightened sense to be focused, to be sharp, and to deliver uh, because there are going to be a lot of questions and we, we just can't wait to get people in our buildings listening to a, you know, a comic again, a great band, having a banquet coming for a rotary meeting, things like that. Um, so again, we, we will see how we've seen how important this, this industry, this, uh, you know, restaurants, hotels, all these other meeting spaces, live entertainment venues are to, to the world. Um, but again, there, there'll be a hyper vigilance and a real deliberate, you know, it's be very deliberate. And for, you know, for hospitality folks, we like to smile and we like to laugh. And so we really have to focus and, and dig down and say, you know what, we got to make sure that everybody walking in this building um, feels like they're in their home. Because right now our homes are our safe places, right? And then, uh, and we should have been, you know, a lot of that we should have always been doing. Um, but there's never a time like now to really hone in on those details and uh, get it right. Yeah. We have to get it right. So maybe, uh, maybe, uh, Distance makes the heart grow fonder. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absence does indeed make the heart grow fonder, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Debbie? Yeah, and I think uh, both Angie and Joe are spot on with what their their comments were. But I also think that, like we touched on a little earlier, the creativity. Because, you know, and as a former meeting planner before even working with different meeting planners, if we broke, don't fix it. So you kind of get in ruts and do the meeting sure. over the same way every year. That's mm -hmm. going to change. And I think you're going to have to um, get more creative, reinvent uh, the programs. They're going to have to learn how to, um, like we said, collaborate with other people, like for ideas, ways, new ways of doing things. And I think that's really exciting. And this is an industry that constantly changes. I've been you know, uh, doing this for over 40 years. And I, people say, well, do you like what you do? I love what I do because every day it's different. I never know what, what's going to happen. And I think that's one thing that keeps us pumped up and excited. It's mm -hmm. just, we just have to look at doing it differently. Okay. So freshness, there's going to be some freshness that comes out of this that, yeah. 
that is maybe foisted upon us, but uh, things we never uh, thought about that are yeah. maybe going to be the yeah. new and even better way of doing yeah. things. Yeah. John. Well, thanks. I think the panel is pretty much uh, put answer answer the question. There's really not a whole lot that I, I can add other than maybe to underline a couple of points. And, and I think Joe, you were talking about it in terms of recognition of the importance of our industry and, and the time that I've been director of tourism. Travel and tourism is one of those industries that everybody thinks is that fun industry. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's where you go on vacation, it's where you go and you have fun at a meeting or whatever it happens to be. But it's taken for granted unless something happens, unless there's a fire or there's a flood or there's a natural disaster. Then all of a sudden people start thinking, wait a minute, what's going to happen to our travel and tourism industry? Right. I think we still even have a ways to go to make mm -hmm. people realize how this uh, pandemic is impacting the leisure hospitality industry perhaps more than any other business and the other industry in the state of Minnesota and it's impacting all those other industries as well so maybe that's a silver lining and then the other silver lining is that we haven't experienced anything like this in, in, in like almost forever and it's going to cause us to innovate and to think about dealing with the customers in a new way that I think will have a lasting impact for years and years to come well I think I think being uh, uh, being forced to innovate um, and being inspired to innovate are both good things. And what we have is an industry that has to keep reinventing itself. The markets change, the resources change. Um, I know that some of our uh, people in the audience might have follow-up questions for any one of you. And just, uh, I'm gonna take the liberty of sharing your emails contact information uh, with them uh, when we send out a thank you email, unless you tell me otherwise. So you're sort of nodding, but, but, and John, you're on the state website anyway. So, uh, Absolutely. Um, public, so, public information. so uh, you've been a great panel and you have, I think, helped shape this conversation and help shape this week long conversation. And remember what we're talking about today, ultimately is part of a, of a grand reopening of Minnesota's economy and it make happen one bite at a time or one industry at a time. And I think every step we take as a community and as economy, we will um, make the next segment more successful. We do wanna ask our uh, guests, uh, webinar guests to participate in a poll that would give us some information to help uh, uh, the next uh, parts of our series. So if we could ask everybody um, who has been attending this, who's um, been on the webinar to just respond to this uh, two-part question. How helpful did you find this webinar? And regardless of how helpful you found it, what can we do better? What can we improve upon? As we're, as we're taking the time to allow people to respond, I want to I want to let the audience know that uh, we also have launched a micro grant program, a grant program that helps to support business innovation, trend, business transition innovation. A lot of efforts happening in Rochester and, and other communities to help during this transition. As people are responding to the poll, I want to thank you, John, for um, your time and Joe for all that you do in leading Rochester and Angie your hands-on approach and uh, uh, Angie and I serve on boards together and I know how actively she is involved in the community and Debbie joining us from your home in, in the Twin Cities as one of the leading providers of meeting planning. This has been, you guys have been a great panel. You've done a great job. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. And to our uh, team that's been supporting today's webinar, thank you. You've done an outstanding job. And to all that participated, thank you for coming. Um, we'll end today and welcome people back tomorrow for a session that will feature Andrew Zimran and Maureen Bausch, um, state and national uh, experts, along with local experts, Savara Vinji and Eric Claver and um, others from our community, Lizzie Haywood from People's Food Co-op as we talk about reopening Main Street. So thank you all very much. It's been a great to have you.